Good morning and welcome to the show. This is In Touch and In Touch is our weekly half hour public affairs show. At the end of the program today, I will tell you how you could be on the program if you are a member of a nonprofit group or organization here in the Hudson Valley in Orange County and Sullivan County. Uh, if you are a company uh, who is helping out a nonprofit organization, either through getting the word out, uh, maybe uh, financially to uh, help get some membership drives, whatever the case may be. Uh, if you're doing work that helps out a nonprofit group organization, we'd love to have you on the show. I, I really, you know, I joke when Tom is here, Tom Lawrence is the library director of the Poughkeepsie Public Library District. I There is a joke, but seriously, he's just waiting for me to be quiet <laughs> <laughs> because he really, you know, he doesn't need me. But Tom, good morning. We all <laughs> need you, Beth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's very nice to have you back. It's always, it's always, I always learn something. It's always amazing to me all that's going on at the, at the Poughkeepsie Public Library District, the programs you guys have, the the people that you help, the, you know, you, the library district, to say that it's an important member of our community is an understatement. And that's the staff and you guys in setting the tone. Well, we, we would like to think that we provide a lot of services the community can take advantage of. Uh, whether they n- think they need them at the moment, uh, we're always there. Uh, and, and you know, our goal is to be the best public library we can be in the Hudson Valley, and we think we're darn close to that. But, you know, it's not because of me, it's because of my staff, and it's because of all the support that we get from the voters mm-hmm. who every year support us at the ballot um, in, in, in good numbers, and, and we're very thankful for that. So let's get us caught up. I, I think... Gosh, Jewel was here a little while ago. She was here talking about the big read, I believe. Right. So you time. and I haven't talked for a while. No, it's been so, a year. Well, probably. Darn Maybe, close. Maybe, yeah. So let's okay. catch up. Yeah, let's do that. Okay. <laughs> well, one of the first things I want to tell your listeners who live in the Poughkeepsie area, that if they subscribe to our newsletter, and now if you live in the city or the town of Poughkeepsie, you should be automatically getting our, uh, it's about quarterly newsletter called the Rotunda. We changed the format of that two issues ago. It's no longer like a tabloid newspaper, but it's a stapled booklet. So it's an eight and a half by 11 document, and it's about uh, 20 to 24 pages long, and it sort of you know tells everything that's going on in the library district. We changed the format because people were getting lost. They knew that they saw something, but they couldn't track it down, and we figured that the smaller the page, the more likely they're going to find where they what they were looking for. Anyway... Uh, since we've last talked and, and we made that change in the rotunda, I, I want to talk a little bit first about our ongoing collaboration with the Roosevelt Library and Museum in Hyde Park. Um, we had been approached by the library on ways that we could collaborate more to um, raise their profile in the community. You know, the FDR Library is a national or an international tourist destination, but but the presidential libraries really nationwide like to reach out to the local community, many people who forget that that, that incredible resource is available. Uh, one of the things they did first was to offer um, public library patrons a free family pass to the library and the museum. It doesn't get you into the house because it's run by a separate administration, but you can tour the library and the museum um, by calling the library at um, 485 3445 extension 3702 and you can get a free family pass to the FDR library and museum um, and and it we email the pass to you so you don't even have to return the pass oh. to us so it's pretty convenient but beyond that we are working with them on a multi-year series called the words of war and basically it's to commemorate the 100th anniversary of events that both led to and concluded World War I, because we're in that centenary era right now, mm-hmm. and to then commemorate the 75th anniversary of everything related to World War II. Wow. And in doing so, we've brought some interesting scholars to the community and have collaborated with the library, most specifically on their exhibit on Executive Order 9066, which authorized the internment of Japanese Americans on the West Coast. They brought in George Takai, who spoke to members on the anniversary of the uh, executive order. And then the week after that, we brought in the author, Julia Tsuka, who lives in New York City and wrote a book called When the Emperor Was Divine, which was a memoir about her mother and her parents' um, internment in uh, Topaz, in Camp Topaz in Utah. The family was separated. The father went to a uh, more serious camp and actually I think wound up in Tule Lake, which is where 
most of the um, Japanese sympathizers uh, went, as opposed to just Japanese Americans who had the misfortune of being Japanese American at the time of Pearl Harbor. But uh, she spoke very eloquently to about 250 people about her life, her life as affected by her mother's experiences in incarcerated in an American concentration camp, basically. Um, but, you know, it, and she spoke about, you know, comparing those times to these times. And times are always different. You know, we always look at history with a lens that we have. And sometimes it's not as kind or fair. Um, but, you know, th- there is certainly a lot of reconstruction of the view of our internment of Japanese Americans and that there was no validation for it. Um, but people operated in a very fearful time. And, you know, the reasons that motivated FDR to do what he did were sort of explored. And, and, but we really didn't focus on the political aspects of it, but morely the personal effect mm-hmm. uh, of what happened. Um, that was a great program. And on April 9th, we had noted author Eric Larson come and talk to the, at the library. He's written, you know, Devil in the White City. Um, he wrote Dead Wake, which is about the sinking of the Lusitania. But he spoke to us about his um, novel uh, In the Garden of Beasts, we, which was about Ambassador Dodd's experiences in uh, pre-World War II Nazi Germany uh, from like the 34 up through 38, 39. And it was fascinating, you know, to have that historical perspective. Again, it's a historical fiction. He's not, you know, it's wrapped in quotes and all of that, but it's clearly not um, what the words that were spoken per se, but just a very good, very good um, presentation by the author. We just finished up a program, uh, a series of programs on World War I, because we had received a grant from the Gilder Lehrman Society, which is a society in New York City devoted towards the further understanding and interpretation of American history. And they had put together a traveling exhibit on America's entry into World War I and its effects on this country. And as a result of getting the grant, we brought in a scholar or two and um, had Mark Nyberg from the U.S. Army War College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, talk about what World War I did to us in terms of global politics and globalism, because we were clearly a different country after World War I than before. And, and the forces that were working to keep us out of the war and, and those that wanted us to move the country forward and to be more progressive in the way we viewed everything. So that was a fascinating discussion. And the other program that we did, there was something new for the libraries that we did a coffee house. Uh, obviously, World War I had a great literary movement, much of it in poetry afterwards because of the horrors of the war. So we interspersed music of, of that the soldiers would have sung in various wars, trying to think more of World War I. But there's more from the Civil War in that line um, and the poetry of World War I. And we had a coffee house at Borderman Road where we had you know two poems, two songs, two poems, two songs. And what was fun about it is that the participants in true coffee house fashion were able to interact with the performers as it went on. So it was interesting. It was a, it was a new format that, that um, we've never done before, but we'll probably look forward to doing again. Uh, But moving on and looking forward, we have some great things coming up. First of all, everybody anticipates the big read in um, the October time frame. This year we're doing something a little different. Uh, The big read people from Arts Midwest in Minneapolis sort of changed the focus of the big read. They went from uh, classic American authors from the 20s, 30s, and 40s, all of whom, well, most of whom are dead. Um, And they shifted it to... not new, but established authors that might not have been heard of as much in terms of probably the idea was to fulfill a a living author's, you know, goal of being heard while they're alive. This year we've picked the book, How We Became Human, which is uh, freeform prose and poetry uh, from the Native American poet Joy Harjo. She's on faculty at the University of Tennessee and was just recently awarded um, the major poetry prize, which I think is the Rudder Award. I, sorry, I should probably know that, but I don't. Uh, she'll be here in Poughkeepsie in mid-October as part of the Big Read. We're again collaborating with the Hudson Valley Philharmonic uh, on a kickoff concert event that will feature the Native American flutist George Nakai. Nakai. Mm-hmm. And uh, he'll be performing. Um, she'll be in town 
And it's just going to be very interesting. It's very different. Um, the schools are very excited about this because it's not a huge chunk of time that's required to participate because poetry can be a day or two. Um, but it's, it's also the ability to integrate the big read into social studies, Native American studies, and so on and so forth. So we're, we're, we're excited about it. Uh, where we're going in 2018 with a big read, we don't know yet. But um, we'll get through 2017 and we'll <laughs> let you know. Uh, some neat upcoming programs that are happening in the month of June. Uh, on June 3rd, we're hosting uh, a program called, um, well, we're calling it The Great Sing Along. And it's about uh, the history of the, of the 50s and 60s through song. Um, New York Blues Hall of Fame inductee Mark Black is coming into town, and, and he's basically going to take us through a sing-along musical journey of the 50s and 60s with a slideshow that sort of marries music with the history of the era. And, you know, those of us who remember the VH1 music series where they took each decade and they talked about the music in terms of the history of what was going on, We'll find it fascinating, and those those documentaries are great. I love you know, those. it it really contextualizes <laughs> why the Carpenters were so popular. You know, because mm-hmm. they were, and, and you know, right now people think of the Carpenters, and many people think it's bubblegum, you know, pop music, very milk toasty. But they served a role at the time for a generation that was floundering, or or an older generation that couldn't understand what the younger generation was all about. But taking music and interpreting it in terms of the history is really great. So it's a, it's a neat intellectual activity that should be a lot of fun. On June 14th, we are welcoming back Christina Baker Klein. She was with us when we opened the Boardman Road Branch Library. She's the author of Orphan Train, oh, yeah. which if people have not read, I, I they really should. Uh, it's a great book, and hopefully it'll become a great movie sometime. But she wrote a book recently. It was on the bestseller list for a short time this past spring, called A Piece of the World. It's about Andrew Wyeth and his, the model that he used for his painting, Christina's World, which is an invalided woman in Maine, in Cushing, Maine. And it's, you know, I don't want to say speculative historical fiction, but it it, it explores the relationship that Wyeth may have had with a woman, which was understood to be platonic, um, but that it it was somewhat complicated. And how he came about to using her and that very iconic fo- a painting of a woman on the grass in a tr- in a uh, house up on the distant hill. She'll be talking about how she came to write the book, what she learned about Wyeth, and then she's going to spend some time actually exploring Andrew Wyeth's paintings, stuff that she had learned while she was researching the book. And that's on June 14th at 7 o'clock at the Boardman Road Branch Library. Uh, in July, we're welcoming author Jeff Shara, who, along with his father, have written numerous historical fiction books about the Revolution, the Civil War, uh, World War One, World War Two, and he has a new book that, which came out last week on the Korean War called The Frozen Hours. Mm-hmm. And he'll be talking about his experiences writing um, historical fiction revolving around war. And uh, that's uh, Saturday afternoon, July 22nd at 2.30 p.m. at the Boardman Road Branch Library. Not the, both all people are listeners are advised to check the calendar to make sure if there's a registration necessary, because mm-hmm. some of our events are so popular that we do require registrations. Uh, we don't want to turn people away at the door if we can avoid it. Um, so the best way to make sure you get a seat for some of these bigger items is to, to register online at the calendar which is at our website, which is www.poklib.org. And we do all of our summer reading program stuff as as every year, every public library does. And we have some kickoff parties going on in, um, I should tell you the exact dates. Um, But we're also trying something new this year, and we're we're working on an uh, an adult summer reading program. And we're inviting adults who want to come in and talk about the kinds of things they like to read as a kickoff. And then we're going to have a little bit of a party at the end about what people read. And, and we're giving, we're, we're sort of encouraging people to read um, eight different books over the summer. Uh, and they go along the lines of a book that you were born or that was, that was printed when you were born or set when you were born uh, a book that takes place in New York um, a book that's maybe science fiction, but things that can encourage people to maybe read something a little bit 
less than the predictable stuff they would normally read. <coughs> Excuse me. So the summer reading program kickoffs for the kids are on, I think, the... Ooh, I'm sorry. I'm scrolling through our calendar here. No problem. Oh, there's one on Monday, the 26th of June. And then there's another one on... Oh, I'm sorry. The adult program kickoff is on the 27th of June. Again, these will be in the upcoming rotunda that, that'll be mailed out very shortly. And um, they're also available on... This information is available on our website and on our calendar. But these are opportunities to sort of get oriented to a summer reading program that you might want to participate in or have your kids or grandkids be part of to encourage reading over the summer. For kids, it's so important. It helps avoid the summer slide. Uh, kids who read usually succeed, which is a very cliched term. But, you know, if you, if you keep kids reading, whether it's a magazine, a newspaper, or a book, they're going to be encouraged to read as they get older. And the other thing that's so critical is that adults read. Mm -hmm. And it's not necessarily adults read to their kids, but their kids see them as adults reading and that it's a useful activity. And it is so critical that fathers do that. Um, you know, boys especially may not be inclined to want to read, but if they see their father as a role model sitting down and reading the newspaper, reading a magazine, reading a book, it might have a positive impact on them actually doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. Um and they might actually find some fun, common things to read about and talk about. Uh, but that, it's just so important that, that parents read to their kids and have their kids see them reading. Uh, do you have any questions? No, but I do, <laughs> but I do I'll like allow you that to talk at this because point. Because with our grandson, I realized that um, I thought, you know, when he sees me, I'm either doing something on the iPad, you know, either responding to an email. He doesn't know that I'm reading. He sees yeah. me looking at a screen and and. Typically, I'm not reading a book. I mean, right. I do have Kindle, but typically right. I'm not reading a book. And about maybe six or seven months ago, I thought to myself, you know what? You need to put this down mm -hmm. because he's watching you. And then when you say to him, okay, you can do this, but here's your limit. You have five minutes and you right. can, or 10 minutes. And I'm thinking, he's a smart little guy and he's kind of looking going, you know, this doesn't seem fair. So I've, I've made a concerted effort to either... Maybe I'm crocheting. Maybe I'm I'm cutting out pattern pieces. There's other things that I do that he sees me do. And my husband is usually reading. He's got a book. He's got something. He's mm -hmm. reading the newspaper. He's reading a book. He's looking at maps and atlases. So I thought I'm I'm the weakest link in the chain here <laughs> with my my technology. So I think that's powerful that you say that because I don't think people realize that. Um you know, how many times you go out to lunch or to dinner and you see tables around you, everybody's head is down and they're all right. looking at their phone right. and we do it so much that you don't think about it. So then these same people who stare down yell at their kids for staring down. Right. But they're just doing what they see. So you got to switch it up. Right. You got to change it. So and, I like that. And there are times, you know, I'll be accused at home of being on the computer too often, but I sometimes am really engaged in reading an article, mm -hmm. but the optics aren't very good. We're all about optics now. Uh, just, you know, getting off the screens and um, either talking, God forbid, uh, or, or just engage in, in, a, in a good old reading. The other thing that, that can be fun, particularly with kids your grandchild's age, is to read aloud to them a good story. Mm -hmm. You know, the old-fashioned, you know, I, I can remember when our daughter was in, in elementary school, we read, oh, God, now I'm going to forget the name, um, but it's a book about a dog. It's Clifford? not Sounder. Clifford? No, no, no. It's 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 by Phyllis. Oh. Oh God, what's her name? This is horrible because it's a great it's a it's a tearjerker of a book. Um, but anyway, uh, so we all sat around with a box of Kleenex and we took turns Aww. reading, you know, and and when you know, my my daughter was old enough to participate in it, but we we explored the book together as a family by reading it together mm -hmm. orally and not just reading it and and it was really a lot of fun you know and 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 it we took maybe a half an hour every so often to do it and we got through the book um now it's going to really bug me that i can't remember the name of the book but that's okay that's what patrons come to the library for all the time that's right well and you know with our two little guys and and the the one is 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 younger is two but sometimes they bring out so many books from their room that i'm like okay we're not gonna be up until 8 30 ah. 
you know, not, I mean, come on. So you kind of almost have to pick and choose. And there's a couple of books that are, of course, favorites. And there's a point where I will stop because I know they know how to, they know what it is. Even if they don't really are reading it, they know it and they do it in the voice and they do it in the character. And I think that that's kind of fun too, because yeah. that helps the story come alive for them. And, you know, it's all about dinosaurs and manners. You know, and what do dinosaurs, do, you know, and the whole thing. So um, I think we have four of those of those books. And then uh, Pete the Cat is a favorite right now. Hey, Pete the Cat's the rage. Pete the Cat is a favorite. Now there's a new book out or learning to dance or something. And that one must be purchased. Well. So we will. Or go to the library <laughs> and borrow it. Or go to the library it. and borrow it. Exactly. The book I'm thinking of is Shiloh. Ah, uh, okay. It's a great yeah, book. Yeah, great book. You would need... Issues yeah, for that. and another really good book to read aloud as a family is um, because of Win Dixie, which <gasps> was a movie. Yes, um, but the book, you know, every book's a little different than the movie because it 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 allows you to explore in a visual manner that a movie sometimes can't do, even though we do have CGI now. But uh, it, it, it's yeah, a great book to sit and read as a family. That you know? that's very powerful. Yeah, that's very powerful. I know. I wondered if you know what. This, forgive me, I, I don't know the answer. But I know there was a movie called Secondhand Lions. I wonder if there was a book. It starred Robert Duvall and um, Michael Caine. And it was and it was this really powerful story of these two um, older brothers who apparently had this wild history that the family, they thought maybe they were crazy, that they didn't really think the history was true. And then as it turns out, it was true. And everyone thought they were crazy. And the, and a young boy, they have a they have a niece who's just kind of crazy, and she drops her son off for this for a couple of weeks, and he ends up staying, and he never wants to leave. And he's freaked out at first, but then they really become a family. There's so many lessons. There's so many great. There's moments where you cry. There's moments where you laugh, and then you discover, like I said at the end, you go like you could almost hear it in the room going. <gasps> It was true. They did do that. So I was wondering if there was a book because I don't know. I, I know the movie, but um, I'd be curious or what it's based off of. I don't know if it was an original screenplay. Well, doing a quick adapted. Google search as a as a good librarian would start with, <laughs> but not end with. Uh, it doesn't look like it looks like it was originally a movie. Oh, was it written yeah. just for the screen? Yeah. Because that's something that I would love to read. You know what I mean? Sometimes you see things and you're like, oh, I, I'd like to wonder if they could explore this a little bit more, yeah. you know, kind of go down this path a little more in detail. The other thing that I think is really important, too, is that while, you know, Harry Potter has and still continues to be, I guess, the rage, um, as a family, move beyond Harry Potter. You know, if you have a kid who might have been a reluctant reader and likes Harry Potter, um, get them to read other books as well. I mean, there are, there are a lot of other books like Artemis Fowl that are sort mm -hmm. of Harry Potter-ish. Mm -hmm. um, those are neat books to read aloud or, or just to read. But um, don't limit yourself to one author or one type of book. While a kid might be interested in reading, get them to read something that's a little bit of a challenge, both from a lextile, uh, excuse me, a lexile rating, meaning the re reading level, uh, as well as the subject area. You know, I unfortunately didn't do that as a kid. I read primarily historical fiction, and sort of I'm sort of stuck there. But I never found of of I never found any interest in the Harry Potter books, and I think it's probably because I just had one path that I read when I was younger. Um, pretty much, that's what my mother would read. So I and I've always been interested in history, but um, I'm clearly one of the two people in the world that has not read. <laughs> A Harry Potter book, <laughs> and I tried. I tried. My daughter tried. I love and them. It just didn't. It just didn't click with us, which is fine. Right. There's always a book for somebody. Yeah, I like the fact that when you when you talked about the adult reading program, which is cool, and the kickoff, and I was intrigued by when you said, you know, read eight books in the summer and read read a book that might have been published when you were born. Mm -hmm. Read a book because that really that would stretch you. That would get you out of that comfort because I Correct. tend to. If I look at the books that I read, I tend to stay in it. Well, because it, in the you same. Know, people, most people choose to read because it either relaxes them, they want to go where the book takes them, and they want to go where they want to go, and authors will take them where they want to go. But every once in a while, sneak one in that takes you someplace different. Yeah. Uh, we, do our, we have been running over the several summers um, Blind Date with a Book, 
which is a program whereby we put books out on the shelves in an area in a display that have brown paper wrappers on them. <laughs> and you don't really know the book that. that you're getting. There are some hints about the book, but it's designed to encourage people to read something they might not otherwise read. And we do ask people to fill out some kind of a form about the book, whether they took to it, whether they didn't take to it. Um, and and there's no, there's no success or failure in this. It's just an experience. And most of the people who have participated in the program have said, you know, I never would have read this book. I might not read more of this author, but thank you for pushing this to me. You know, you have to have an open mind. Mm-hmm. And there may be some content that you're not happy with. And we try to be careful that we don't pick too edgy of a book because we're not looking to offend. Right. And by all means, if you're offended by the book that you get, just return it. But but give every book a chance because, you know, every author is out there finding their audience and you might be part of it without giving that author a particular chance. Um, I have tried reading a variety of books and I've never been taken to mysteries. Uh, I've, I just have, I just can't wrap my mind around them. Um, but I did read one two years ago, two years ago. That's probably the most <laughs> recent one. And I, I enjoyed it. You know, it was a guy mystery and, uh, it, it was fine. You know, sometimes mysteries get a little too implausible about how the detective wraps everything up, but that's for me and my analytical mind. You know, somebody might be very happy with that, which is fine. You know, that's why libraries are always challenged. You know, the technology, the authors, the type of material that's out there continues to expand, and we can't contract because we still have an audience. I mean, we circulate almost half a million books a year. Wow. You know, how do you, you can't you can't guarantee what people are going to like. Just to turn to to one other thing, um, we are looking at launching a an e branch, uh, which hmm. we'll probably do at some point in in late in June, where we'll pull together all of our digital services, and then with that, we're going to offer patrons a digital card which would not require you to come into the library to take any to 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 prove anything. Normally when you get a library card you have to prove residency and you have to have a proof of address so that we can mail things to you in the event that you become delinquent. Um, and also that you're eligible for some of the things that we subscribe to or license that are really for our chartered population only. But what we're going to do is offer a digital card which will not allow you access to any physical items but all of our digital content. Currently, we have books on tape and downloadable audiobooks, excuse me, not books on tape, ebooks yeah. and downloadable audiobooks through the Overdrive service, which many of your listeners are familiar with. We have a streaming music service called Freegal, which gives you three hours of streaming per day, uh, free of charge, of the entire Sony music catalog with over oh, wow. 11 million titles. Wow. Yeah. We have a product called Zinio, which are digital magazines, all the popular magazines. We currently subscribe to probably about 200, 250 titles, most anything that you're interested in. Uh, we um, are probably going to add two, well, we are, not probably, I just don't know the time frame. We're adding two more streaming services. One is called Quello, which people may have heard of, but it's musical. It's concerts of all types and documentaries. Mm -hmm. And then we're also going to be offering Hoopla, which are streaming oh, yeah. movies and TV shows. Uh, we also have a service called Tumble Books, which going back to reading to kids, but it's interactive reading where the book is actually displayed on the computer and their words oh. are illuminated as the story is read. We have another service called Day by Day New York, which is an early literacy service, provided to us through the New York State Library, where every day there's a different theme, a different story, some poems and activities that if you want to engage in early literacy activity with your child, uh, you can go to this site and it'll basically give it all to you. And it's something different every day. You can look back at what's been done for the previous month. You can see what's coming out there, uh, coming at you. So if you're a daycare provider and you want to have a literacy activity for the morning uh, or you're a mom that just needs to keep your kid a little focused, this is something that's eligible that you're eligible to get at. And also consumer reports. We subscribe to the full text mm -hmm. of consumer reports. So what we want to do is bring all these things together yeah. and make them available to patrons because we recognize that you know, we're living in an, in an era where you don't need a library card to get a physical book. We're not discouraging that. We Our book circulation continues to hold steady, but we also recognize that people have different ways of doing things. They have different time commitments. We can't be open 24-7 physically, but we can be digitally. So that's what we're looking to do. 
That's very, very cool. I'm excited about that. I also like it all in one place. Yeah. That that makes it easy because sometimes it's like, you know, trying to find it. And, and especially if you're talking uh, of an audience of like young moms who are working and they have little ones, mm-hmm. then by the time they get them and then get dinner, then the library is, like you said, you can't possibly be open 24-7. This would open up. Correct. This would be yep. very, very cool. So, Tom, believe it or not, we have to wrap up. That's fine. I'm Clo- done. Closing comments, final thoughts you'd like to leave with folks? No, I just thank the, the public for their support. You know, we require a vote every year, and it's it's a, a healthy margin of win. And I would just encourage the people who don't think there's anything, anything for them at the public library to go check us out. And if there's something they would like to see us do, whether it's a particular kind of program, it's a particular kind of service, please get in touch with us. We'll very, very much consider it because if you want it, somebody else might and we'll we'll do our best to be able to provide it. Tom, thank you very, very much for everything. And just, I, I love hearing about what's going on and it's amazing when you go, well, we did this, we did this, we have this, we have this. So for those of you listening this morning, whatever radio station you're listening to, head to the website. This um, interview will be there. Just keyword in touch. It's an on-demand feature, so we will have an article around the interview. Uh, we'll have links to the site. We'll have the phone, a couple of phone numbers that were mentioned as well. Those will all be there. And you can also, uh, you know, open up the interview and uh, jump ahead to wherever you need to be to get the information. But, Tom, thank you again very much for being here. Thank you here. for the opportunity to come and talk. Absolutely. And thanks to all of you. Hopefully there's something that you can take away from the show today. If you'd like to be on the program, here's how you can do it. Give me a call, 845 471 one five zero zero. My extension is one five nine. You can email me Beth at townsquaremedia dot com, and you can find me on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and Pinterest. So just find us. We'd love to have you on the show. Take care of yourself and those you love, and we'll see you right here next week.